Hello, I'm Peter Bradshaw of The Guardian. Welcome back to this vlog. This week I've been reading Jonathan Coe's forthcoming novel, Mr Wilder and Me. A very entertaining, if somewhat niche, novel which returns this most cinephile of English novelists to the actual subject of the cinema for the first time since his 90s breakthrough, What a Carve Up. The novel is inspired partly by Billy Wilder and partly by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the protagonist is an Anglo-Greek composer of film music called Callista, a married woman with grown-up children who, in middle age, looks back to an extraordinary time in her life in the 1970s, when, as a teenager, she was miraculously taken under the wing of the legendary film director Billy Wilder and invited to come with him and his equally legendary screenwriter and collaborator I.A.L. Diamond to a Greek island where he is shooting his latest film, Fedora. Callista is of course fictional. She is perhaps inspired partly by Billy Wilder's actual protege on that shoot, a young man called Rex McGee, whose published memories of filming form the basis of much writing about the making of Fedora. Fedora itself is a strange, peculiar and somewhat fascinating movie. It's perhaps a B-side to Sunset Boulevard, or perhaps it's the case that the two films are a double A-side. William Holder plays Barry Detweiler, an ageing and somewhat desperate independent film producer who comes to a Greek island on a mission to make contact with a woman called Fedora, a legendary and reclusive Garbo-esque actress whom he is trying to persuade to take part in his new proposed adaptation of Anna Karenina. Eerily, she can't remember having had an affair with him once when they were both young and just as eerily, she does not appear to have aged, whereas he looks rattled and careworn. This clip shows their first somewhat stressed meeting in a crowded tourist shop. Did you say we worked together? That's right, MGM. That's all gone now, isn't it? Just about. They sold the back lot, auctioned everything off. You know that big golden bed shaped like a gondola where you made love to Robert Taylor? Went for 450 bucks. Robert Taylor, he died, didn't he? Back in 69. Gable's gone, Tracy, Joan Crawford. I guess time catches up with all of us. Not you, Fedora. You look no different than you did 30 years ago. Thank you. Don't you remember the beach, Santa Monica, in my roadster? It was all so long ago. Yeah, Truman was president and we were telling knock-knock jokes. Well, goodbye, mister. Uh, wait a minute. I, I came all the way from California just to see you. Oh, really? Yes, I'm a producer now. I made about a dozen pictures. Uh, one of them, Chinaman's Chance, got three nominations. I never see films anymore. Well, I'm preparing a new one. A great woman's part. It was written just for you. Was it? I sent you the script. I never got it. As a matter of fact, I sent you three scripts. One to Paris, one to Marbella, and one here. They keep things from me. Well, who's they? They lie to me. They watch me all the time. And the people at the villa? I thought they were your friends. I have no friends. Now, Barry Detweiler is, of course, really Billy Wilder, but then so is Fedora herself. Back in the days of Sunset Boulevard, Gloria Swanson was yearning for the days of silent cinema. Now in this film, they're yearning for the days of the talkies, the golden age that came after that. Perhaps cinema itself is eternally fated to be nostalgic like this, because the act of filming is to freeze someone poignantly in an unending youth. Now, as for Jonathan Coe's novel, Callista is conceived on a very comparable youth versus age template. She's a bit like Barry, and she's a bit like Fedora, but she doesn't have Barry's desperation, and she doesn't have Fedora's paranoid sense of imprisonment. What Callista and Barry, and probably Fedora, have in common is their intense appreciation of the magical quality of youth, which can only be appreciated, and in a sense experienced, decades later. Although I think that Callista in Jonathan Coe's novel accepts the passing of that youth with more grace than anybody in Billy Wilder's film. Anyway, it's a terrific novel. It's coming out next week. Mr. Wilder and Me by Jonathan Coe. Please read it. <coughs> Elizabeth Moss and Michael Stuhlbarg are pretty much two of the best actors working in America today. And for a film to feature the pair of them creates a virtual perfect storm of indie cinema good taste. Here they are in the new film from Josephine Decker, Shirley, a fictionalised account of an episode in the life of the great horror author Shirley Jackson. Freud would have had a field day. I'm counting down from three. Three, two, one.
Elizabeth Moss plays Shirley Jackson, the real-life horror author who became a legend for her 1948 New Yorker short story, The Lottery. And Stuhlblag plays her husband, Stanley Hyman, a rather mean-minded and pompous academic critic who is kind of salieri to her Mozart and pretty much salieri to everyone else. The nightmare begins when this couple invite a junior professor and his young pregnant wife to stay with them and the film becomes a cross between Rosemary's Baby and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. The problem with this film for me is that it doesn't quite have the courage of its own nihilist convictions. It seems frightened at the finish of giving us a really dark ending, which is incidentally something that never worried Shirley Jackson herself. But my goodness, what incredible performances from Elizabeth Moss and Michael Stuhlbarg. Wait! Robert Zemeckis is back this week with a new version of The Witches by Roald Dahl. Witches. They're real. And they hate children. Welcome. What would you do if there were mice learning all around us is so dead? I would call the exterminator. You see, girl? He would exterminate those brats. Uh... Rats. We would exterminate the rats. This was the Roald Dahl story that was last filmed in 1990 by Nick Rourke with Angelica Houston as the Grand High Witch. Now it's Anne Hathaway doing her very best with a massive and slightly strained Cruella de Vil turn. I can never watch or read anything to do with Roald Dahl without remembering Kingsley Amis's anecdote about meeting Dahl at a party in the late 70s and Dahl telling him he should have a go at writing children's fiction. And when Kingsley Amis said that no, his heart wouldn't be in it, Dahl replied, never mind, the little bastards would swallow it. And The Witches returns us to that great question, who did Roald Dahl hate more, children or adults? Hey! Once again, I want to finish by reading out uh, an email. This is from the Ipcress Cinephile. He or she says, dear Pete, I watch and subscribe to your vlog and I enclose here with a link to an article from The Economist showing that subscribers to your YouTube channel are 23% more likely to own property by their 40s. That's interesting, I didn't know that. Anyway, he or she says, do you offer any merch via your YouTube channel, such as, say, t-shirts, key rings, novelty mugs, mouse mats with your face on them, or perhaps a collected edition of your reviews? Now, it's interesting you say that, Ipcrest Cinephile, because yes, I have a book entitled The Films That Made Me, which is, in fact, a collected edition of my reviews. Do please buy it. <laughs> That's it. Thanks very much, as ever, for watching this vlog. Give it a like, give it a share, and subscribe. <laughs>